you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. I am in a series uh, in Romans, and uh, uh, my plans were to start the series back, uh, but uh, the Lord changed my mind. I was writing this sermon for to actually teach on Wednesday night, and the more I wrote and the more I prayed, God said, uh, you need to do this for somebody on Sunday morning. So next week, uh, we will pick up at, in the book of Romans, and uh, I've always learned uh, that it's better to obey than stay on a scheduled plan. And so uh, hopefully this uh, sermon will bless your life. 1 Kings chapter 17, I want to preach a sermon called God Provides. God Provides. And folks, even that alone is a sermon. Uh, God is the source of everything we do. God provides for us in all situations in life. And if you have a bulletin and you want to follow along, number one, God met Elijah's needs. God met Elijah's needs. And folks, we all have needs. There's different needs represented here today, but I promise you, God will meet your needs. Now, the timing of all that is not what we like sometimes. It's kind of like Lori and I, we would like this to be over sooner than it's going to be, all right? But God meets your needs. Number two, God, helps other, God helped others through Elijah. God helped others through Elijah. And folks, it's not always about us. When, especially when you're talking about Jesus, it is about others. And the third thing, God performed miracles through Elijah. God performed miracles through Elijah. And I know what you're thinking when you read that. Well, I can't do a miracle. Well, I beg to differ with you. I will say today you are going to learn that you can do a miracle, and we'll share that with you uh, later on in our sermon. 1 Kings chapter uh, 17. In 1 Kings 16, Ahab, the son of Omri, was king over Israel. Verse 30 says, Ahab, who was the king, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all before him. And folks, if you look at some of the kings that were there in the Old Testament before him, there were some bad kings. So we're talking about the worst of the worst, okay? His wife's name was Jezebel, who worshipped Baal and set up altars for Baal in the temple of Baal that, uh, Ahab, that Ahab had erected there. She was determined to wipe out the worship of Jehovah God in Israel. Her plans was to eliminate all worshipers of Jehovah and have everyone in the kingdom worship Baal. Enters Elijah, the prophet of God. God was going, going to use Elijah in a mighty way to protect the people of Israel. In the next two chapters of 1 Kings, Elijah records seven Seven miracles he either experienced or performed. Let's look at the first three miracles found in 1 Kings 17. And by the way, I find it interesting that the God of Baal was actually called the God of Storms. And we know what's fixing to come up. Elijah is praying a drought on them, and Baal could not uh, break that because, folks, our God Jehovah is almighty. He is most powerful, yet this false god couldn't make it rain for three and a half years. Verse 1, verse 1 in our text, God met Elijah's need. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew or rain these years except at my word. Well, the first thing you can think of here is, uh, you know, Elijah being a prophet, going up to Ahab, he could have uh, had him seized and thrown in prison and ex executed. But he had a, a job to do. He was to prophesy. He was God's spo spoke person. And so he literally went to this king and says, I've got news for you. It's not going to rain here for three and a half years. And folks, you have to understand, that is devastating to to the crops, that's devastating to the water supply, and eventually it could be life-threatening 
when there was food and, and there was famines. There's, there's a lot of times there was famine in the land. And part of it was because the false god that Israel would serve. They would do right and they'd do good for a while. And then they would go wrong and they would uh, intermarry with these pagans and folks. And he told them not to do that. And part of these things and the droughts were God's judgment on Israel. Now look at verse 2. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide in the brook of Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. Why did he flee? I'm not, I don't think it was so much as he was scared. But folks, you know if he prophesied that and it started happening, they would be looking for him. There would be a bounty on his head. So in some ways, uh, there was a price put on his head because he taught and, and prophesied the word of God. Folks, the Word of God is truth. It's yes, it is amen. And we're not going to back up. We're not going to shut up. All right? We are here as ministers of the gospel to preach the Word of God. Verse 4, And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So wherever God leads you, when you are in the will of God, He's going to take care of you. He's going to meet your needs. Now, this is a strange way to meet needs because ravens, if you remember in the Old Testament, were what they called dirty birds, okay? They ate dead stuff. They weren't, you know, they picked stuff up off the ground. But, but Elijah knew and understood that God uh, was using these ra ravens to deliver food to him. So look at verse 5. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, and he went and stayed at the brook of Cherith, uh, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. So God, even in isolation, and folks, it was just a time of refreshment, okay? There are times in our lives, and, and even as ministers, folks, we need vacations. We need time away. We need time for rest and relaxation. God had a plan, and you, you have to understand God was giving him rest to carry out this huge plan that he had in the next two chapters. And then verse 7 says, And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain. And the first thing you think is, well, why did God do that? I'll tell you why. Because he wanted Elijah to move on. He was sending Elijah a lesson. Hold your finger there and go to Philippians with me. God met Elijah's needs. Go to the book of Philippians. Philippians 4, verse 11. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Folks, we need to learn this as Christians. We need to be content with what we have. In third world countries, I'm telling you, I've been in five countries, and in the poverty-stricken countries, the first thing they think of when they get up, they are looking for wood to start a fire, and they are looking for food to eat. In America, we go in and we look in our refrigerators, we look in our cabinets, and try to decide what we are going to eat. And folks, we are a blessed nation. We are a blessed people, and we need to be content where God has us at this point. Now look at verse 12. And I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Paul's saying, I've been hungry. I've been there. Okay? There were a lot of things, the persecutions that went on in his life. And he's saying, I know what it means to have nothing. I know how, what it means to have everything. Everywhere in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And I love this verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, listen to me, folks. There are situations in life that we don't understand. There are situations in life like a lost job, okay? You didn't do anything wrong. They were just downsizing, and you didn't have the right amount of years. And these things happen to teach us lessons in life. God is not going to leave you. 
God is not going to have you hungry. God is going to take care of your needs. And while we're there, folks, there's a difference between a need and a want. A need is something you need to have. Food, shelter, and clothing. A want is things that you just desire. And it's not wrong to have things, folks. It's not wrong. But we need to understand God is the source of everything that we have. God is the source. Folks, it's not the government. It's not the situation that we are in life. My God can do anything, anything, and He will meet your needs according to Scripture. Now skip down to verse 19. And my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory by Jesus Christ. I got news to you folks. Money never runs out where God is. God will provide. We may not have the finest of things. We may not have an abundance of things. But God promises to meet our need. And we find those needs in prayer. Give those needs to God. Pray earnestly, and I promise you, He will answer. Now, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. So we see here, even a miracle here, that God used ravens that brought uh, Elijah bread and meat. The second thing I want you to see, not only did God meet Elijah's needs, but God helped others through Elijah. Look at verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came and said to him, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. And when you look at that per se, you don't think it's a big deal. But folks, he was going uh, northeast 100 miles, and he was going closer to Ahab's and especially Jezebel's hometown. You would think he would go the other way. But folks, we are also under the divine protection of God. God protects us, folks. I think all of us can give testimonies to things, especially in vehicles where we've had close calls. I'm telling you, I was sitting there at the light this week at, at McDonald's and turned left, going to my house, and I was watching the traffic go, and this truck was barreling down towards the south. And I saw him and I thought, he's not going to get stopped. Well, the light turns red, and he's barreling down through there, and the car behind me starts honking. And I'm like, you know, my flesh wanted to get out and say, ma'am, if you would have saw that, and it was a lady, I'm not, I'm just saying what it was, I'm not, okay, I'm, Lord forgive me, if I, but I look back, and, and that, tr if I would have went when that light turned green, I would have been plowed into by a semi-truck going 50 to 50 miles per hour. What did God do? God helped me see that truck and, and release me of that danger. Folks, we're in, uh, we are under the protection of God. Nothing's going to happen to you that God doesn't allow. And there are things called accidents. I understand that. It doesn't mean you're not going to be in an accident. It simply means God is is in control. Then it says, see, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. And you have to understand widows of that day, folks, I'm telling you, uh, they did not have an income. Usually they're, they're, you know, it was a single income. The man of the house brought the income. And many widows in that day especially were dirt poor. They didn't have money. And it says, verse 10, so he arose and went to Zephyrath, and he came to the gate of the city, and indeed a widow was gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I might drink. And notice a pattern in Elijah's life. Every time God spoke, he basically said, Here I am. I am listening, and I will obey. Folks, that's so important. If you want to be in the center of God's will for your life. And as she was about to get it, he called her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in the jar. 
And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that my, I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. The sticks were running out. Okay, the, the fire for wood. There had not been, uh, a year's time had passed and there had been a drought there. So they didn't have things in abundance at this time. And they did not have the resources. And being a poor widow, she couldn't go out and make that happen. But God had a plan, folks. God always has a plan for His people. And one thing I want you to see in verse 12, this is very important. As the Lord your God lives. We, were talk we are talking about a Gentile area. So she was not knowing the God that Elijah served. She just knew there was something different about this God. She knew that there was a God, but let me say this, folks, just believing in a God does not make you a Christian. So at this time, it, there's evidence there. Folks, one word can change Scripture, just change a thought. Not change Scripture, but a thought. And that, I, that really jumped out at me uh, when I was reading through this. And you talk about somebody that was down and out. You talk about somebody that literally said, I don't have the flour, I don't have the oil. Me and my son are going to enjoy this last bread together and die. You talk about hurting inside. This was a desperate lady. Verse 13, and Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Over 365 times in the Word of God, it says, do not fear. Listen to me, folks. We have nothing to fear as Christians. God is with us. God is in us. And as you go and do as you said, but make a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. Why did he say first? I believe it was because she was going to exercise faith. Because uh, the natural tendency for a widow thinking we don't have much is to not share with someone else. But there was something about the spirit of Elijah. There was something about the situation that had her do what Elijah asked her to do. Verse 14, and thus says the Lord, God of Israel, the bend of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. And you have to understand, folks, uh, chronologically, only about a year, maybe a year and a half had passed. So there was still probably two years of drought. And Elijah said, thus saith the Lord, Listen, ma'am, you're going to be taken care of. And I know it would be hard. She never met this guy. She didn't know who this guy was. She had to put her faith in someone that she had never met. But her, you know, her, 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 her spirit was saying, I am going to do what this man asked me to, to do. Look at verse 15. So she went away and did according to the word of of Elijah, and she and, her, and he and the household ate for many days. And the bend of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run out according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke unto Elijah. So you see, the second miracle is, and you know, it's like right now, I'm going to the grocery store. That is not something I do, all right? And I'm just telling you, ladies, uh, y'all are all, all mothers and women are awesome is all I can say, all right? And I'm not used to that. But usually you have to go every week to the grocery store. But in this case, I'm telling you, God provided that oil and that flour never ran out, ever. And that was truly a miracle of God. Look at 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians 1. Second Corinthians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, I am telling you, we are a blessed people. We are a blessed nation. We are a blessed congregation. 
Blessed be the Father of Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. He had mercy on this widow, okay? And the God of all comfort, she thought they were going to die. She thought she was giving her son, her only son, the last meal. But God met that need through a prophet named Elijah, who comforts us in all tribulation. Just because we are Christians doesn't mean we're not going to have problems. We're going to have problems in life. We're going to have persecution in life. But I'm telling you, our God is the problem solver. He is the problem solver. The Word of God has a, a word to all of us. Every situation in life, it can be solved in the Word of God. There's no situation that hasn't already taken place or that is new to you. God knows what He's doing. God is wanting to help you. We just have to yield to Him and to listen to Him and to obey Him that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort uh, for which we ourselves were comforted by God. Do you know why God blesses you? So that you can be a blessing to others. And folks, when God meets our needs, we need to look around and see other people who are hurting. And many of these people, and I, I understand, there are people trying to beat the system. There are freeloaders. There are people that come and take advantage of, of that. But that's where you pray. That's where you discern. That's where you talk to God and ask God, do I give this? I mean, it's just like panhandlers. They're, they're everywhere. And, and I'm just saying, you have to pray and you have to ask God, do I need to help this person? And here, I'm telling you, God told Elijah, man, I blessed you. I fed you for a year. You ate meat and bread twice a day. So you take care of this lady. And you ask, well, why would he take Elijah off the scene for three and a half years to meet one lady's need? Because she had a great need. It was twofold. He was hiding. He was waiting for the time to expire there, but he also uh, had Elijah on a mission, which I will share with you in just a second. So folks, when we, and, and I can say this about our church, when I say a family is hurting, one of our family members, we go way beyond what, what normal is, and we meet that need. And, and I thank God for those who share in ministry to help other people who have needs. So we see God met Elijah's needs. God helped others through Elijah. And number three, God performed miracles through Elijah. Look at verse 17. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. Folks, people get sick. Okay? Accidents do happen. And uh, the sickness was so serious, there was no breath left in him. And folks, we know in Genesis said, God breathed life into Adam, into man. And when the life is gone, or when the breath is gone, there is no life. See, some people want to explain this way and say, well, he's just probably sick and unconscious. Well, folks, if a man's not breathing, he's dead, okay? That's a fact of life. Verse 18, so she, so she said to Elijah, what have I to do with you, O man of God? Have you come to bring uh, my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? Why would she say that? Folks, I'm telling you, it's that motherly instinct. Okay, that motherly instinct kick, kicked in and just sometimes it kicks in in the blame game. Something happened to him, and it's someone's fault. If you remember later on in the New Testament, Jesus came up to a blind man, and, and after the blind man was healed, or, or before the blind man was healed, actually, one of the disciples says, well, whose fault is that? Is that his or is it his parents? And Jesus said, it's nobody's fault. Okay, he was born blind. If a person goes blind, it's not anybody's fault. 
okay? It's life. And the same thing was here. And even in her own life, God was working because what she did, first she kind of, in a way, blamed him, and then she blamed herself. She said, I must have done something really bad for God to kill my son. And neither was the case. Look at verse 19. And he said to her, give me your son. And, and again, for him, for her to just give him, to hand over the body, the dead body of her son was an act of faith. So he took him out of his arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his own bed. What did he do? He went away. He wasn't doing it for, for publicity. He wasn't doing it so everyone would see what he see, what, what he was about to see. He was obeying God, and God told him to do this. And then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? He's crying out to God. He's saying, I, I'm feeling bad. I, you know, if I'm fault, if, if I have sin in my life, I mean, he was even some way blaming himself for that. And then verse 21 says, And he stretched himself out on the child, three times and cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. What is he doing? He was praying the prayer of faith. He was acknowledging it. He knew that God could do this. He knew in his heart of hearts and in his prayer that God was powerful and that could make this happen. And the question is, and again, when it says lay on him, I mean, it wasn't that he was on top of the guy. He was right, this is the way I see it, he was right next to him. He was literally touching him, and he was uh, praying over him three times. Matter of fact, you know, when you think, how long was Jesus away when, when he passed away between the time he died and his resurrection? It was three days. Three days, and the same thing here three times. I, I, I see some, a similarity there. Now look at verse 22. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back to him, and he revived. Folks, this is the first miracle. This is the first person that was ever dead in the Word of God, and he revived. Folks, only God can do that. Only God. See, today we want to, you know, we want to give the medicine or a doctor or a certain, and, and I'm all for going to doctors. I'm all for healing. But I am telling you, life, all life is given by God. And God, and, and I even heard a doctor one time say this, okay, in, in a room. He just said, listen, this guy, this, guy, this surgery will live or die depending on my hands. And man, that just didn't set well with me because I, as a pastor, wanted to say, no, your hands God will use, but if this guy is healed, it will be because of God. Folks, let me to put it this way. Man has no healing power. We don't have the ability to do that, but God does. And notice what Elijah did. He started praying. Folks, I cannot tell you how important prayer is to your life. Prayer is getting in contact with God, praying in faith, believing and trusting in God. Verse 23, And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. You talk about something exciting going on. You're talking about a happy widow. You're talking about a happy mother just rejoicing knowing that his son, her son was literally dead and he lived. Now look at verse 24. Then the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. What is she saying? She said, now I know your God is powerful. Now I believe what you're saying is true. What is she saying? And some, some commentaries disagree. 
Some don't believe she got saved, but folks, I believe because of chapter or verse 24, she had a moment where the Spirit went on her and she made a profession of faith. And folks, that's why God sent Elijah to her at this time. Even earlier than that, when the drought just started, all this, because he fed her, which again, we eat and we eat and we eat, and then we're still hungry. We're never satisfied. We're always looking for something. Man, at 10 o'clock at night, my refrigerator opens all the time. But I'll still get up and eat at breakfast. But Elijah was used by God for the salvation of this woman and possibly the son. And here's where I say, you can do a miracle. And I understand God does it. I understand it takes the Holy Spirit, it takes the Word of God. But every time someone gets saved, it's a miracle of God. They were snatched out of hell's jaws, and they were placed into heaven. And we as Christians have that obligation. We as Christians have that privilege. We need to meet the physical needs. I'm all for that in missions. I'm all for the Samaritan's Purse. I'm all for those ones that are trying to help people. But I'm telling you, their soul needs saving. And the gospel of Jesus Christ came to this woman because Elijah obeyed God. James chapter 5, and we close with this. James 5. Is there anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And we have done that. I have done that when a family asks to do that. We have done that. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. The Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Folks, God is still in the healing business. He is. And we as Christians, we put those names up there so that you can pray for them. We have a prayer table and out there so you will know those names and, and, and you can send uh, cards to them. Prayer is so important. We still do prayer meeting on Wednesday nights because we know how important prayer is. Look at this. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It doesn't depend on my prayers, but God wants to hear our prayers and we can help through prayer prayers. God does the healing. And look what it says. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced fruit. Folks, bottom line, there's nothing our God can't do. There's nothing. Whatever you need today. If you have a need today, God can meet that need. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your word. And God, I thank you that you, you own the cattle on a thousand hills. I thank you, Lord, that every good and perfect gift comes from you. And God, I pray. And God, I know there's different needs here today. There are people who have came here hurting today. And God, we want to uh, just let them know that God is the answer. We want to let them know that we will pray for them. God, I pray that we would be busy about your business. And Lord, when we get a chance, when you bring somebody our way, God, I pray that we would really consider their spiritual condition. Do they know Jesus Christ? That is the greatest need for mankind, is to know you as our personal Lord and Savior. Matter of fact, the only hope in this world, the only hope is Jesus. So God, I pray that you would touch hearts 
and you would touch lives. I pray that we would take praying seriously and we would pray for the hurting and pray for the lost and to pray for those who lost loved ones and that we would be men and women of prayer. And God, if there's one person here that doesn't know you, God, I pray today would be their day of salvation. God, this is your church. This is about you. We want to glorify you and give you the credit for anything that happens. So God, if a Christian needs to rededicate their life, come for baptism. Lord, I just pray, or even join the church. God, I pray that they would simply listen to the Holy Spirit and obey. God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?